But I think SARS was a difficult time. Largely because um, it was the first big outbreak that, that I personally faced. And that uh, I think it was the first big outbreak for the hospital ever or for Singapore. And, and uh, so everybody was uh, grappling for a solution. So I think the, the the uncertainties that we face and the turmoil we went through came from the fact that we had to uh, scramble for answers. None of those answers was uh, correct. How do I say this? There was no certainty that any of those solutions would be the correct one. And, and therefore, I think the problem is that we just live or had to live through this period of uncertainty. So the uncertainty, of course, uh, affected, that's the correct word, the whole world. Right? The scientific community was trying to find out more about the virus. First of all, they didn't even know that it was a virus. And then, there was need to find out more about the behavior of the virus, uh, some epidemiological data about the virus. And then of course there was the need to do something right on the ground uh, for patients, for the public. So, uh, I, I, I don't know, it was just a very difficult time. How, uh, and and I think that of course when when you didn't know the answers, people had different viewpoints, and therefore viewpoints sometimes overtook the science, and, and, and that that probably contributed to some of the problems. The viewpoints of those who were more powerful. Data, of course. But the H1N1 outbreak was very, very different. Um, partly because, mainly because uh, we were very prepared. By then, hospitals had set up uh, all these preparedness committees, and many things were in place. That enabled us to swing in the election. I remember the being recalled. I can't remember some some evening, Saturday or Sunday or public holiday, after the first announcement of a novel virus appeared in the U.S. And I think the response was was very very good. The, so why was the response so good? Not just because, to my mind, it was not just because there were plans, but rather it was that the plans are so detailed that if you don't look at them, you will really not know what to do. And, and uh, it's because the people who were around the table that day, I think 90% of them had gone through the SARS crisis. So it's your memory cells waking up. And, and you, people don't question you. Uh, why must we do this this way? You know, um, from a scientific viewpoint, from a point of view of electoral curiosity, maybe people should have a question. But but uh, no one questioned the wisdom of why certain things have to be done in a certain way. So, the one big difference in the SARS crisis was that the principles appeared to have been laid down. People just followed. Uh, whether or not they were... And this time, there was no concern among the more intellectual about doing things 
right scientifically. Because the SARS crisis had shown that things had to be done in a certain way. <laughs> so for each one and one, things were just done that way. And I think this, this whole thing about uh, how Singapore is so well organized, all these things about whole of government approach. Uh, in some of us, there was a, a tendency, especially in the early days, to look to ID people for the answers. So ID people were being asked questions that were really administrative But in, in, for each one and one, these were dealt with by the relevant administrators. There was no need to ask the ID people, maybe because some of these things had been handed out during those preparedness committee meetings, but also because people just assumed that what had worked the SARS crisis could, could just be applied again with some minor refinements. And so I find that I, I found the response very coordinated. Uh, but perhaps, perhaps the virus was different. Despite the number of deaths uh, that we had, maybe unusual for influenza, but somehow there was the fear was less pervasive media, public, um, maybe because it was influenza, some people would want to play it down, or some people subconsciously played it down in their minds. Uh, but of course it's very, very different when you have an unknown virus. So the public psyche or the, psy the psychology of the media was also completely different. And because of that, uh, the response from government, from hospitals was also was also different. So I don't know which I don't know whether I don't know which way it worked. Whether the public responded in that way because they had more confidence in the system, or whether or not it was there possibly misplaced understanding of the virus that led them to, to fear less and hence there was also a corresponding difference in the response of the authorities and the, the hospitals. So I don't know. Uh, um, what is interesting is that uh, when you bring up words like isolation and quarantine, in daily hospital life nowadays. Uh, these are not foreign, and I would think that that's a benefit of these crises, that people grasp the concept, and uh, that they grasp the concept. Either they, they are resigned to it, or they want to protest against it. In that particular instance, it's, it's different. But, but at least, uh, It was, there was a process of education, of, there was some educational process that this, this crisis brought on the public. Wow, a lot. Um, okay, first of all, uh, I think the, the we are much more evidence-based in the way we work and, and um, I would like to attribute it to the younger people who came on board such as yourself uh, but I'm aware that um, no one person or no one group can claim credit for that um, there are several parallel events happened short history that make this 
Um, I think that's it as a whole, move towards being more evidence-based. So this is the same, whether you have cardiology or gastroenterology. Um, and secondly, um, the internet, of course, the easy access to information uh, has actually made it possible. I mean, when I was a registrar, um, we actually had to go to the library to photocopy articles. So it was a slightly different time, you know, a very different time. And, and uh, more recently, of course, uh, open access Open access is fairly new. Of course, again, uh, that has reduced the uh, need to go to a physical library. So that's uh, clearly a good thing, and that's clearly one way in which practice has changed. Um, how else has it evolved? Um, I think the, the work of an ID uh, physician um, has become more like the work of a standard American ID physician. Um, so, ID physicians have course, of course existed in Singapore before me. But some of the earliest ones, uh, for example, work mainly communicable diseases. And in the eyes of uh, many of the older doctors, then ID people are in charge of malaria, typhoid. But now, of course, people look to ID when, when they have a prosthetic joint infection. Sometimes the neurologists and cardiologists ask ID physicians to take over patients with meningitis and endocarditis. So, and I actually think it's good for the specialty that that's happening. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that these things are possible with greater numbers on the ground. Uh, that we have a transplant ID service in the hospital that's present in major tertiary centres in the US, but may not be present in other, well, certainly wasn't present in Singapore when I started, may not be present even in some countries today. Um, we run an OPEC service, uh, a field of work that is, most hospitals left to the ID physician. Run a travel service. Uh, again, the field is usually left to ID uh, physicians. And uh, we run this do antibiotic stewardship program. Many hospitals run that. Uh, something that didn't exist at my time when I was in training. So I think. In terms of uh, evolution, uh, it has certainly come a long way. Uh, the greater number of people on the ground means that you can branch off into these specialties. You can take up. You can take up cudgels for for these aspects of care. So. Uh, you can talk about stewardship and its benefits, but if you can't run the program, if you don't put, if you don't have the manpower, you can't convince admin to give you the resources, then then it's not going to happen. So I think when, when we say it has evolved, it's evolved for good, uh, and it has evolved only because we have had greater numbers on the ground. I really don't know. I think <laughs> that uh, I've said this many times before being available and affable is very important. Um, 
And I think it's very important to be a good all-rounder. Um, the value of an ID physician, the value of any specialist, is not the ability to spew out uh, the latest guideline or to act according to the latest guideline. Because in the age of the internet, everybody knows the latest guideline. If I want to quarrel with a colleague, I can look up the latest guideline in cardiology, question him, and ask him. You know, uh, I'm chairman of PNT, and I look up many guidelines to, figure, to make sure that people are not trying to pull wool over my eyes. So I think that uh, in the age of the internet, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. To be up to date. It's easy to be up to date. Uh, so, the hallmark, I think, goes back to being a good diagnostician. Uh, and amazingly, it's because of uh, the narrowing of subspecialties. Um, ID physicians are forced to be broad based. They have to be broad based, and and uh, you know, um, to me, the best way to save on an antibiotic is to make a diagnosis of gouty arthritis. That's the end of you know, kind of like what I said. Um, you cannot. See that the hypotension is due to hypocortisolism. There's no end to the investigations and the neuropenem and escalation of antibiotics. So, and of course, making the right diagnosis is important to the patient. So, to me, applying a whole person approach, uh, whether you are an physician or not, is important. But I feel that. ID physicians are more able to do this than other people. I don't know why, but in so doing, uh, this sort of characteristic, I don't know, being broad based, would uh, be an important feature of an ID physician. There's one more feature which I think is quite important, uh, but unfortunately you can only develop that with, you can only begin to possess that, if you possess the right word at all, uh, after many years of experience. It's when a colleague asks you whether or not we actually should do the operation now, whether We need another CT scan now versus two weeks later. Uh, in other words, when you move towards the evidence free zones or when you have to interpret evidence and the guidelines for the patient in front of you. And I'm sure this happens in many other specialties, but I think that because ID physicians are what they are. Uh, their input is particularly valuable in a multidisciplinary approach. So, uh, as someone working in a transplant team, you know, I say that ID's input on transplant patients on a regular basis, on daily rounds, at, at uh, review meetings has been invaluable to the patient and the whole team. But if you look at the latest SMIT guidelines on endocarditis, there's mention of an endocarditis team. And, and I think that uh, the hallmark of an ID, a good ID physician, is to be able to play a valuable role in this sort of 
multidisciplinary medicine, which actually is the way to go nowadays. So I think to me the most important is that it should continue to to be a valued specialty in in our hospital.